And welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us. We know we have representatives from around the country and even from uh, many countries around the world. We know we have folks who are teachers and administrators. We know we have young people. We know we have board members. We know we have political figures. We know we have uh, social and emotional learning experts uh, in many, many, from many walks of life. We want to welcome everyone for this extraordinarily important conversation. Just before we came on, uh, my colleague, who you'll meet in just a minute, Dr. Leah Samuel, said her word for the year is gratitude. And I just want to echo uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Samuel will share with us in a few minutes. Our gratitude to each of you for your interest and your commitment, uh, the enormous amount of hard work and dedication that's involved in leading and challenging us to make this field a powerful and effective for every young person in the country. Uh, we're very grateful to each of you. And maybe by way of just beginning, we can note that, you know, this is a tough time. It's a tough time in the country uh, as we come out of this pandemic. Many young people, many teachers have, have endured enormous struggles and are still struggling to find their footing, try, find the, the cadences and the rhythms of day-to-day of -day life that will allow them to flourish and thrive in school. Uh, many wounds uh, are enduring and uh, everybody's really trying hard. And in, in an environment like that, the work of the social and emotional learning field becomes all the more important. And so our gratitude comes not just to professional to professional, but human to human. This is a tough time. Politics is leading to a lot of struggles. I mean, politics is a necessary part of the world and certainly of our country. Uh, but sometimes it feels like it's overwhelming. Sometimes it's distracting. Sometimes it's just about name calling. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to as, remove ourselves a little bit from that kind of distraction and focus on what really works. Uh, what's going on in the field of social emotional learning? What does, as we've asked for 30 years, what does the evidence tell us? You're in for a terrific opportunity to hear from the best people in the world, I dare say, who can help us answer that question. What do we know that people need and want and are asking for in the field of social and emotional learning? Our parents, our students, our teachers. And what do we know works? What is the evidence telling us? That's what our topic is today. Before we get into the, the meat of the research, the first research presentation and my brief introduction of our guests, maybe I'd invite you to just take a breath and um, picture yourself in a school where social and emotional learning programs are really flourishing. And maybe you can picture yourself in a school you've actually been in where that's happening, in which case you can take a snapshot of the cafeteria or of a third grade or a sixth grade classroom or of the hall, uh, maybe outdoors in the school. You've seen the evidence of social and emotional development, strengthened, resilient, strong, um, self-regulated, strong relationship building young people and teachers. And while we don't have a chat for you to share your vision or your image, maybe just take a moment and write it down. What, what are you seeing right now uh, as the picture of success, as an image of something that inspires you to believe that this work is essential? Uh, this is work of the head and of evidence, but it's also work of the heart. So maybe hold that picture, if not on a piece of paper in front of you, in your own heart as we dive in. So with all that, uh, that's that's it for me. For the most part, I want to uh, invite you to join me in welcoming uh, uh, Dr. Mark Greenberg, who's Emeritus Professor at Penn State. He's a founding member of CASEL. He's going to share, I mean, I, I dare say there is no one in the world who has a longer track record of monitoring and investigating the effects of social and emotional learning strategies than Dr. Mark Greenberg. When Mark is done with the presentation, you get even more treats. We get to be joined by Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, who is president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, also Professor Emeritus at Stanford. Uh, and for many of us, the person, uh, I don't want to say we grew up with, because that would make us sound younger than we are, but the person who mentored many of us through her scholarship and through her leadership in trying to see the importance of the whole child. Uh, we couldn't ask for anyone with more insight into that this work than Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. And then we'll be joined also by Dr. Leah Samuel, who is the president and CEO of CASEL. She's been in that role for a little over a year and she's rocking the world with her leadership and her vision for 
what this field can and should be in our public discourse, in our policy making, in our practice, and in our research. We'll get to Dr. Linda Darling Hammond and Dr. Leah Samuel after we hand it over first to Mark, Dr. Mark Greenberg, who will give us the benefit of a view of the big meta analyses that are out there, both those historic and more recent ones, and a quick update on what we know, what the evidence is telling us about what works. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Thanks, Tim. Um, I, I was just thinking about my four adjectives uh, that I would think of for a school that I walked into, and I wrote down supportive, caring, joyful, and challenging. And uh, I hope that, we, I think we all hope, we all yearn for the schools that have those characteristics. And um, I appreciate the time to briefly discuss some of the highlights of this report, this LPR report that I authored, as well as other new evidence in the field. And I wanna start by giving a shout out to the many researchers around the world who have studied SEL. It's really remarkable. And the many teachers, administrators, and parents who've been willing to participate in order to see whether SEL programs do or do not improve children's outcomes. Because in the end, the science of SEL is about showing that children who receive SEL programs do or do not show social, emotional, cognitive, and academic benefits compared to comparable children who don't receive these programs. This is really the, what we call the evidence and, and it's critical and it's why this field has grown. Now, from a research and policy standpoint, we know that any one study is not sufficient to rely on to make major decisions on the future of schools or on policy or funding. For example, you'd probably be reluctant to take a new drug or uh, have a new surgery that did not have much evidence. I know I would, I'd wait for more evidence. However, when a field grows and there are many studies, we can begin to assess the overall effects uh, of across these studies. And that's exactly what a meta-analysis is. I wanted to spend time on this because everything is based on this idea of meta-analysis. It's an analysis that combines across studies to develop a sense of the absolute effect. It gives us a lot of statistical power and it, it decreases the amount of error in our estimates of how things work. And so it's very important to understand that this is not about a single study, but about many studies. And there have now been 12 meta-analysis. Of course, the first one that many of us know about is the Durlac et al. from 2011. But since then, there have been 11 more meta-analysis. And in this table, I just really briefly summarize how many of the meta-analysis uh, looked at each of these five categories, SCL skills, social behaviors, et cetera. The effect size, which I'll spend a little time mentioning, and then the effects of the programs. And when you see effect sizes that are positive, that is, there's no negative, it's not a negative 0.23, but uh, just an 0.23, it means it's a positive effect. Now, uh, how to interpret these effect sizes is a bit complicated. And Matthew Kraft, a uh, uh, well-known education researcher, looked at 774, I believe, randomized trials in education. And he proposes that a small effect is about 0.5 to, uh, or so. Uh, a medium effect size is 0.5 to 0.20. And a large effect size is greater than 0.20. Very few, for example, uh, randomized trials of reading interventions have shown an effect larger than 0.20 for reading interventions. Uh, and you can see the effect sizes here on uh, SEL skills, social behavior, conduct problems, emotional distress, and academic performance are all in the medium to large size. And this is not a, a just from one meta-analysis, for example, the original Durlac, but a summary across all 12 meta-analyses. But there's even, uh, so one of the questions is, wh how does this occur? What is, what is this causing this? Why, why should uh, using a social emotional learning program to teach children uh, social and emotional competencies, why should it lead to these uh, diverse outcomes? And I think the reason why is that when you implement a universal SEL program with fidelity, with, with teachers who are well-trained and have readiness and good administrative support, it, it leads, of course, to higher SEL competencies, which I just showed you in, in the meta-analysis table. But it also leads to more pro-social behavior and more positive relationships. Children feel like they are part of a community and they belong. And this leads to lower disruptive behavior and emotional distress. 
And isn't it sort of not rocket science anymore to say that when children have higher competencies, they get along well with others, they can stop and calm down when they're upset, they can think through both interpersonal and academic problems, they feel they belong and they're getting along well with their friends, that of course they engage more in learning. And we know that the time engaged in learning is one of the most important things in improving academic achievement. There's also the question of executive functions that we know are important for cognitive abilities. And a variety of SEL studies have also shown their effect on executive functions. But there's even more to say about this, I think. One is that uh, one of the things is that the universal SEL programs not only show promotion, that is promote well-being and positive outcomes, but they also prevent and reduce disruptive behavior problems and emotional distress. And this is a twofer because we know from the long history of SEL programs, in fact, many of them were called violence prevention programs uh, in the 70s and 80s, that, uh, that when you teach children these skills that uh, allow them to get along with others, to stop and calm down, to manage conflict, et cetera, of course, it reduces their disruptive behaviors and their emotional stress because we're giving them skills to express themselves. But it also promotes their well-being and of course leads to positive outcomes. Now, there's even more uh, evidence that um, is, is uh, just come out. Uh, uh, you know that uh, the, the classic uh, uh, Durlach meta-analysis in 2011, but Durlach, Mahoney and colleagues have just uh, published a new meta-analysis. In, um, and this is very important because it's uh, 523 studies, the majority randomized trials, and they showed that when you meta-analyze the meta-analysis, so now this is a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, that again, you see that across all these studies in many places, uh, we see the same kinds of effects that I've just shown you on the slide. But there's even a new one hot off the press, a newer meta-analysis, and it's so surprising we see Durlach's name again, the father of meta-analysis in SEL, uh, led by Chris Cipriano and people at Yale. Uh, it's studies, it's, it's mostly newer studies. They're post the Durlach 2011, as many of the newer meta-analyses are. It's not a repeat of the same studies. From 2008 to 2020, and you can see over 575,000 students were involved, 424 studies of 258 separate analyses. And the amazing thing here is from 53 countries that SEL has very much become an international phenomena that schools all around the world are interested in, and for good reason. And in fact, only 45% of the reports are US-based in this new analysis by Cipriano, which also creates a, a database that can be used by many investigators. In fact, here's a map that shows you in the newest meta-analysis, uh, 53 countries are now involved in not just doing SEL, but studying the science and doing randomized trials to show the evidence of SEL. So this is now not a, 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 no longer a, a US phenomena as it maybe originally began. It's now in many countries across the world uh, of very different uh, ethnicities, of socioeconomic statuses and of cultures. So when we look at all of this and we look at the characteristic of the most effective programs, and I wanna thank Cipriano and Durlach for some of these summary judgments, uh, first of all, we know that the most effective programs meet the safe criteria that Roger Weisberg and Castle has talked about for a long time, which is being sequenced, being active, being developmentally focused, and teaching explicit skills. Secondly, they're delivered by classroom teachers, and this is very critical that the classroom teacher who is with children all the time can generalize and maintain these skills, can integrate it with the rest of the academic day. Uh, it's critical that classroom teachers are uh, well-provisioned and trained to, uh, to do this kind of work. The best uh, interventions also focus on both skills and climate. That is, they're uh, around teaching kids explicit skills, but also focusing on the climate of the classroom and the school. So making this school-wide is very important. And that's uh, they're also using a multi-component approach. That means that there's not only a, a classroom uh, curriculum, but there are things that might be done on the playground, uh, might be done in the in the cafeteria, of course, reaching out to parents and having parents become involved, uh, maybe connecting to after school or out of school programs, using a multi-component approach. 
uh, uh, Cipriano found, in fact, that uh, teaching intrapersonal skills first is important. Interpers intrapersonal skills are skills like being able to stop and calm down. And we know that uh, most of the things that we as adults, as well as children do, that we regret are usually because we didn't stop and calm down. And so this ability to stop and understand that something's happening around you or inside of you is critical first step uh, for behavior. And lastly, uh, they've, they've integrated SEL into academic content. Uh, and while there are some curriculums that just exclusively do that, uh, most curriculums uh, teach skills in a, in a standard curriculum that's an SEL curriculum, but also linked to academic content. And lastly, high quality implementation is critical. And we know that that depends on high quality training. So many people have been wondering about the impacts. Are they similar or different across different categories and uh, of children, of, of communities, et cetera? And the evidence so far, and this is a lot of evidence, this is about a thousand studies altogether, uh, show that there do not seem to be broad differences, significant differences across ages or grade levels, across gender, across family socioeconomic status, even urban versus rural status. These programs seem to work well in both contexts or in US versus other countries. Oftentimes, of course, the, the studies are done on programs that are developed within their countries. But one of the things that uh, has come up, of course, and Tim, you mentioned it in the, your introduction, is the, the stress uh, and the retention issues for educators. Uh, we know that teachers with strong social emotional competencies have stronger relationship with their students. They have fewer discipline problems as, as a result. Students become more engaged. Uh, students become strong, more strongly attached to school. They have a sense of belonging, which we know predicts both academic achievement and, and uh, staying in school, and, and, and as a result, higher academic performance. And there are five meta-analyses now just on teacher SEL programs, not student curriculum, but only for the teacher themselves on their own well-being, their own social-emotional competencies. Five meta-analyses conclusively show that these programs can improve teacher well-being. And yet I want to note that there are very few evidence-based, educator-focused SEL programs being used in U.S. schools at this time. So the re research, I believe, is very conclusive. But there are ways to improve the next generation of SEL research. And science doesn't stand still. We, uh, we in continually increase <laughs> our, our, our requirements for what we consider to be good science. And that's true in every field, and it's true in this one. One important thing is we need larger samples in our studies because we want to detect important but small events. For example, referrals to special education or dropout that occur at relatively low levels to have, uh, to have a, a significant effect size. We need to examine longer term outcomes. And there are some, uh, there is a meta-analysis, uh, both Durlax and others that have looked at somewhat longer term analysis. But we want to look in the long term, not just at effects at post-test, not just teacher reports, but longer term outcomes that look, might look at uh, uh, academic scores. They might look at mental health problems. They may look at um, a, ver a variety of outcomes, including physical health outcomes. The other thing is we need to look beyond main effects. When I showed you those effect sizes, those are the effect sizes overall. That is the control group compared to the treatment group, the intervention group. But we know that some uh, interventions may only affect certain parts of the population. For example, they may only affect children that begin with uh, a high impulsivity, or they may be more effective for girls. And so we want to look beyond main effects to understand the effects on different groups of children by ethnicity, by disability, uh, LGBT uh, classification, all kinds of different ways that we can characterize children because some programs may have effects on some groups more so than others, and it's important for us to understand that, that issue. Well, ensuring replication of effects by independent, research, uh, independent researchers is important. We know that many programs begin by being evaluated by the people who develop the programs. I'm an example of this in, in 1980. Um, but independent replication by researchers that are completely independent from the uh, program are really critical, and uh, we need many more of these in the field. Uh, lastly, we need to assess multiple outcomes that fully test the intervention model. 
And, and uh, it, of course, this is important in terms of uh, assessment. And we need to use similar assessments, more similar assessments across studies so we can compare them. And lastly, I think a, a critical issue is identify better ways for programs to promote cultural competence. And this is cultural competence uh, across many, many different kinds of cultural situations. So just to wrap up, what do we know? We know that social emotional learning works. We have positive outcomes, including academic success. We have outcomes across grades and contexts. We know it's doable. There's no question at this point. I mean, 25, 30 years ago, I was told that there would never be any time in education for this kind of work. And yet now we know that it improves both behavior and academic outcomes. Now we have time for it. It's doable. Well-trained teachers show strong outcomes. And uh, there's good economic data to show that there's a good economic return on investment, somewhere between 10 and $20 saved for every dollar that's spent. And lastly, it needs support. Well, we know that it works. We know that uh, it's doable. This requires strong leadership. It requires, it requires quality professional development. It require, requires effective planning to lead to effective implementation. And it requires greater support by federal and state policies. So with that, Tim, I'm going to try to hand it back over to you and stop sharing. And uh, let's go to discussion. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, extraordinary, concise, quick. I just want to note how uh, reassuring it is to hear you say how open this field is to learning, to changing, to understanding what works and what doesn't work. There's sometimes in politics, it's an us versus them. In this field, it's very much a uh, us together trying to get as good as we can get, not unafraid of of the evidence uh, when it points us in directions that aren't working and eager to pursue the evidence that points us in directions that are. But enough from me. Let me welcome Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond and Dr. Leah Samuel to the conversation. We have so much to discuss. There's wonderful questions in the chat, which we'll get to in a minute. But let's start, uh, Linda, with you. Um, you've looked at this field uh, you know, over several decades, as Mark has. Uh, are you seeing specific practices in schools, in classrooms uh, that's working where, where you're seeing, well, that's what we got to focus on. Some of the questions, Mark, even, you know, what do we know are working for subpopulations? What are you seeing that it gives you kind of a sense of encouragement that, uh, that things can, can be effective? Well, one of the things that has been so marked in the pandemic years is that the schools that had really strongly rooted social and emotional learning programs and practices, and I'll talk about both, uh, really uh, continued to provide schools that were supportive and joyful and engaging, did not experience the kind of decline in enrollment, the chronic absenteeism to the same extent as other schools. And we've seen schools that have actually had gains in achievement during the pandemic, despite all of the, you know, um, sort of global um, bloom uh, that has accompanied what is uh, legitimately, you know, trauma that people have experienced and disruption that people have experienced. Uh, but quite often, it is this set of practices that are at the core of that. And we're also seeing now that um, you know, schools that really understand that we are not returning to quote old normal, but we're creating a new normal. Um, lots of uptake of social and emotional learning programs and supports. Uh, that really uh, bring a whole child perspective to everything the school does uh, are, are experiencing, again, a great deal more success. What is really problematic are the schools that are trying to go back to the old normal, where they are trying to drill kids on you. There's an anxiety about we got to get the scores up, you know, and drilling kids on the content and behaving in a punitive manner when kids bring to the school, the dysregulated behavior that accompanies trauma. And we have lots of evidence about, you know, the severe stress and mental health um, challenges that young people are encountering uh, when they come to an environment where uh, if they're having a bad day for any number of reasons, if they are, you know, challenged in how to reconnect, the school is reaching out and connecting them rather than saying, oh, you know, you did something wrong, you're out of here. Um, you know, that's really, uh, there's a huge contrast between the way schools are responding right now. But I would say there's several things that we see that really works. One is, of course, you know, explicit instruction and in social and emotional uh, learning and supports 
uh, mindfulness also, you know, which is kind of a, an adjunct uh, to, to those supports. Um, many schools are also um, connecting this to restorative practices at which social and emotional learning is at the core of uh, those practices, which in, include community circles on a regular basis where kids are sharing their experiences and feelings with each other, where when there are challenges, um, there is a way to uh, learn conflict resolution skills and work them through and make amends and rejoin the community. So those kinds of practices have been extraordinarily successful. There's another literature which overlaps with the literature that Mark just described um, that shows that those kinds of practices which are rooted in social emotional learning uh, create also stronger achievement, reduced disciplinary exclusion uh, and disparities in achievement and exclusion and greater mental health, uh, less depression, uh, less suicidal ideation on the part of kids. So these all go together as you know ways to engage. It's really important that all teachers learn and engage in the social emotional learning practices, not a class off to the side where some kids or kids are getting some useful information, but teachers don't themselves engage in the social emotional learning that Mark talked about. Uh, we all grew up in different kinds of households and bring different kinds of assumptions to the table about how we can get along. And those need to be worked through together with adults and children. So we see much stronger effects where teachers are involved, all the teachers, uh, and where the learnings about social emotional uh, competencies come into the main courses also, so that when you're teaching, I was an old English teacher, when you're teaching your English class, you know, you're giving kids support for how they collaborate in their cooperative learning settings. Uh, when they are doing their work, they have the opportunity to get constructive feedback and revise their work and develop a growth mindset and the perseverance that will, that will allow them to continue. So those kinds of infusions. And finally, we got to find time. Uh, for this work, uh, both the explicit work, the explicit instruction, and then the practicing of the, of the skills. Uh, in middle and high schools, this means finding uh, ways to create advisory systems or other places where kids are being cared for, where they're being noticed, where there's 15 or 20 of them in a family group that's going to stay with the teacher, and where they're learning social and emotional skills while they're also getting social and emotional supports. And where we see those things in a holistic school design, the results are quite extraordinary. Yeah, Linda, so um, uh, I'm glad you underscoring the issue of teachers. There was a couple of questions in the uh, Q&A box about how do we support teachers? Are, are there programs that are particularly effective with teachers? Uh, and I want to come back to that, but I want to, Ali, I want to bring you into this conversation because the, as we all know, the in, in some ways, the most important or maybe the second most important stakeholder community in education is parents, maybe the most important is children. Uh, but the second most important is parents. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of noise in the politics about parents, but uh, you've been looking closely at what parents actually want, uh, what the vast majority of parents and this splits, you know, no, there's no there's very little politics in what parents want, right? When we, we talk about their children, parents seem to have uh, very consistent and very vocal uh, points of view about what they want. Can you share a little bit what you're seeing about that? Sure, Tim. Thank you so much. And I want to start off, um, because I am amongst researchers, to start with the data point, which I think it's important to ground ourselves in the data. What we are seeing and hearing is overwhelmingly there is parent support. Right now, 93% of parents say it's important to them that their schools teach some type of social emotional learning skills, including there's another two thirds of parents in the K-12 world who say that it is extremely or important, extremely and or very important to them. And what we know is that caregivers, parents do want their kids to be happy in school and have a joy of learning and feel a sense of connectedness. And we're seeing that. And also to your point on the two most important audiences, not to say that educators aren't, but parents and kids, even students, they're telling us, we're seeing it by chronic absenteeism scores. We're seeing it with the lack of confidence with their peers, with new activities. 
And so all of the signs are there. And I think it's important to note that while we have overwhelming support by parents, that we can't let the political rhetoric overwhelm or override what we're hearing from parents who have kids that are within the system. And as we think about it, I, I always like to share stories because I think it's so important that we're not just talking heads, but we can really bring the very personal nature of the work into the room. And at Council, one of the things we've really taken great pride in doing is reaching out to parent groups to hear directly from parents from what they're saying. We've hosted a series of roundtables going out into various communities from Ohio to Texas to Nevada, talking to real parents on the ground to understand what are their concerns? How are they receiving information? What do they wanna see more of or less of? And to really answer those very pragmatic questions that we, because I'm a parent of two kids in, in, in you know, elementary and middle school, we wanna understand what's going on and how we can support. And so, uh, and I, I say it all the time, and it's a quote from Carrie Rodriguez, who's the CEO of the National Parents Union. She says, we can't move from transactional relationships with parents. We need to move to transformational relationships with parents. And I think it's so true. And the outreach from F the National Parents un uh, Union, the, P the National PTA, groups coming to us saying, our parents are saying this is important how can we work together and partner? So overwhelmingly, there's a support. I want to share one particular story of a father that I met um, early or mid-March, and uh, he was sharing how his high school son uh, really struggled when he started in high school. He, uh, he was at least three years academically behind. I want to make sure I put that out there. Three years and his son really struggled with confidence. And the school, the high school that his son was entering in has a, a focus on social emotional learning. And the dad shared that over the years, the confidence that he has seen his son have in academics has been extraordinary because of the way the school set up um, their social emotional learning supports and the relationships that he had with his teachers recognizing he did have low confidence. He knew he was behind. Mm -hmm. And as a result of being, this is what the father says, as a result of him, his son being in this high school that focused on social emotional learning, it not only helped him close those academic gaps, but he's graduating this year as salutatorian of his class. The power of relationships. And so I, I just think it's really important to underscore the stories and the impacts um, because there are putting the face to the to what we're talking about in the classroom and, and the outcomes, I think is just so important. Yeah. Thanks, Tim, if I can, uh, Tim, if I could just comment on both of what uh, Linda and Aaliyah said. Uh, the report that we did for LPI, which is available, is really about SEL programs. But SEL programs, as we're saying, are a small part of the broader issue of systemic SEL. And systemic SEL means not just programs with explicit skills in classrooms. It means all these other things. It means a quality climate. It means restorative justice practices rather than harsh discipline. It means true involvement of parents. It means supporting teachers and leaders and principals in this process. It means giving students voice in the, in the processes. It's all these parts that you could find, for example, in the Castle School Guide, for those who are really interested in, in developing a systemic model with programs as a core part. We know that these are central, but we never would think a school alone would just do an SEL program and never do all these other things that are central and critical to children's well-being. Yeah. Mark, I'm glad you mentioned that. It uh, reminds me of the training so many of us got from Dr. James Comer going back into the 60s and 70s, talking about the importance of engaging families and engaging the whole school in a developmental way of thinking. Like, think developmentally, Jim would always say, still always says, think about child development and many, many things in the school culture will change. Strength, relationships will be strengthened. Opportunities will emerge. Mark, you know, there's wonderful questions in here uh, about measures. There's questions about uh, uh, you know where to start and these kinds of things, but there's also implied in a lot of the questions in the chat the question of quality. Uh, you mentioned this when you were going through the studies that if they're done in coordinate, if these programs are done following the safe model, we get these outcomes. But how do we think about quality? How do we avoid what has been 
kind of difficult in education, which is when people feel overwhelmed or frustrated or not trained adequately, they do the check the box version of SEL and it doesn't work and it feels counterproductive. And um, how do we continue to focus our field on quality uh, and what can educators learn about quality that will help them as they're trying to do this work well? It's a great question because implementation is really where it's at in the end. And um, I, I guess a couple things to say. One is we've all been through the check the box. Uh, we've been through places where uh, principals or administrators feel compelled to, to buy SEL curriculums and teachers don't know why they're implementing them and get poor training. And, and it turns out to be a disaster, just like we see for a reading or a science curriculum that's poorly implemented. Same, same kind of problem we see in in education. And so uh, I'll bring in a quote from Abraham Lincoln. He said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four hours sharpening my ax. What that means is that we don't just start a curriculum. We really give teachers training and coaching because uh, almost no teachers uh, currently in, in, in teaching in our schools were well-trained in how to do social emotional learning in their pre-service time. It often starts out as very awkward at the beginning, and it takes both uh, good training support and, uh, in some cases, coaching uh, in the classroom to help teachers really become, um, to live this process, to live the process of having belonging and caring and skill development be central to their pedagogy. Now, this, this is, uh, combines with the issues of COVID and going online and also with the, uh, the business side of SEL, and that is uh, on, online training has become uh, common, but we don't know much about its effects. We know that face-to-face -face training, when done well, leads teachers to implement with quality, and implementing with quality then predicts all these outcomes. Uh, what we don't know much about is the use of educational technology and short online training. And this is something the field needs to be concerned about. We need to have new good studies, some of which will show that, that under certain circumstances, these work well. And on other circumstances and with certain populations or types of schools or kids, they don't. And as you said, Tim, the science is what this is about. We're not trying to advance the field of social emotional learning alone. We're trying to advance the evidence where the high quality outcomes uh, show that children have higher well being and higher uh, academic engagement. That's the bottom line. And, and I can tell you from the history of SEL that uh, I've been involved with programs and many of us have that, that didn't work. And so knowing what doesn't work is, is as important as you said earlier as knowing what does work. Yeah, it's so it's so refreshing to hear a group of people who feel strongly about something also wanting to know what doesn't work, right? There's no turf to protect here for things that don't work. Uh, and so when sometimes people say, well, you're being criticized by this group or that group, and my, my first reaction is terrific. They're taking it seriously. You bring us the evidence of what doesn't work so we can understand the field better. We can understand context. Maybe in certain situations, as you pointed out earlier, there might be certain groups, as Linda said, that where it works, where it doesn't. We want to know that. We're not, um, we're not afraid of, of, of the evidence. and We're not afraid of uh, challenges because uh, that's what will make us better. Linda, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to extend this uh, webinar by an hour just reading the questions. <laughs> I want to ask them all, and I want you guys to answer them all. Uh, one of the questions in the chat is about after school time, out of school time, you know, there, the, this issue of measures. The public policy environment around education has changed. I mean, it changes all the time, I guess, but it seems like dramatically in the last few years alone. If people are listening here thinking about local policy, state policy, and even federal policy, what do we need to know? And what should our voice be asking policymakers to pay attention to and to focus on uh, to help us? Uh, embrace this idea of a, of a systemic approach to the to the whole child and to, and to the developmental needs. Well, you just use the term systemic approach, and I just think that is so important. That um, first of all, school leaders need a vision for all the aspects of the school that are supportive of child development, right? And we've been talking about that, and then be thinking at locally about the policies that will create that systemic approach. We uh, did some work with the Science of Learning and Development Alliance and developed a set of design principles for schools in which social emotional learning 
uh, programs and practices feature very strongly along with those other things that Mark was just talking about that allow you to have all of the school functioning, you know, in sync around a vision. And um, policymakers also need to be thinking about that because the way policy often comes down is like, here's a little program, here's a little thing here, a little thing there, there's some funding for this. And really with ESSER, with the federal funds and uh, some states stepping up, there are so many programs that are being funded. You know, mental health is, is a big piece of this and other things, but that can be overwhelming to schools. How do we make sense of it? How do we bring that into what we're doing in a productive way and use it? Um, one of the strategies that some folks are using is the development of community schools where you actually have a community school coordinator who's grabbing all of these funding streams and integrating them around a vision for whole child practice, Amen. you know, a vision for what's going to support kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we, we need both for policymakers to be thinking about how to integrate, uh, I, you know, uh, at the levels of the federal, state, local, and we need for school people to be thinking about that too, and how to build that, that whole school vision so that the resources that come can be used productively. So of course, there's always, you know, funding uh, for, you know, the engagement in the programs and, and the professional development that's so needed. Um, you know, this question about um, teachers' own social emotional competencies and wellness uh, often gets ignored again, because there isn't really like a, a funding framework for that. So I think that's, you know, a piece of, of what we need to think about in policy. It's also really important to say how important the competencies are. So articulating those competencies, sometimes in standards, sometimes in the profile of a graduate, uh, in uh, very formal ways that say, we care about this, and here is how we're going to work toward it. That is also a policy uh, agenda that is, is important, again, both at the school level and then at the other levels of policy. And then, yeah, I would say that creating, uh, again, these kinds of policies that lean towards systemic social and emotional supports, uh, rather than a little thing here and a little thing there that kind of come and go, uh, getting a more continuous uh, support framework for this kind of learning and um, care for, for children is really important. We also have to get rid of some policies that get in the way. We've got to get rid of zero tolerance policies where they still exist. We've got to get rid of corporal punishment policies where they still exist. We've got to, you know, we've got to remove the conflict that is often experienced in the, at the school level of policies that are antipathic to the kind of support we're trying to help young people learn and the kind of practices we want them to learn. We don't want them, We, as we teach social skills, we want them to be thinking about how do I talk about where I disagree and how do I come to agreement with others and how do we, um, you know, uh, get along in these ways. And there are sometimes policies which are, you know, sit down, shut up, you know, <laughs> or if you, you know, have a disagreement, you know, we we get you out of here. Those kinds of things have to also be addressed. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I remember uh, the great, uh, the late great, uh, our colleague, Dr. Roger Weisberg, and I wrote a piece about I, 20 years ago called No New Wars. And the, pre the premise of the piece was we shouldn't have categorical programs that address symptoms, that we should have, as you're describing, Linda, a comprehensive approach that helps promote development. And so many times policies end up focused on one specific thing and they pull this, the educator gets torn up to pieces by having to change gears every 20 minutes. And it's really counterproductive, but um, uh, you've, you've laid out a good challenge for how we can think about this in a much more integrated way. Aaliyah, you get the next hour and a half to talk <laughs> about politics. <laughs> uh, you know, politics, uh, I saw a poll recently that said that uh, the number one concern of parents in this country was political interference in schools. Um, and I don't think I'm saying anything out of school here and saying our politics can be really, really toxic these days. How do we find the middle? How do we find a way not to make social emotional learning a left wing thing or a right wing thing or a democratic thing or a Republican thing? Uh, how do we make it about children and schools and development and families and educators uh, and avoid some of the pitfalls of the political environment we're living in? Yeah. 
Yeah. So first, um, you know, I, I want to acknowledge the real, the re our reality that right now politics are impacting not only practice but research in very real ways. Where in the past it was always research first, then the policies and practice. Like there, it, and we have flipped it on our head, flipped it on its head, and so we really need to understand the politics and understand the politics of this moment because it is impacting what is happening in classrooms every day. And before I actually answer the question, and I promise I'll land the plane, is that part of this policy conversation is we need to bring more parents and educators to the conversation. We need to invite them, to not just to say, come sit with us, but now come help us think through this and craft policies that really respond to the needs of communities and teachers and educators, and, which is why I got into the policy space. I am not a politician. I'm not a policymaker. I am a pure educator. I was a special ed teacher, assistant principal, principal, and our voices aren't often at the table. And so we really need to figure out how to take a step back to see who's informing these policies first and for foremost. I also think, think that we have to really understand that right now what you're hearing is a tale of two stories, as I like to say. The first tale is kind of some of the headlines that you see at the national level around um, SEL and what it is and what it's not. But then there's a the reality of what happens on the ground every day in that classroom, in that school, and that with that parent who's at the grocery store, the airport, wherever with their child, any place where children and families and people reside, social emotional learning is there in some, in some degree. So we have to really understand that all learning is social and emotional. That is how we learn. Let me think about us right now. We're talking and engaging and bouncing off of each other. That is what's happening in the classroom. And so I think it's very important to understand what kids and all kids are experiencing because SEL historically has not been a partisan issue and we can't let that happen now. Because if you really ask parents, let's just stick with the parent theme or anybody that is connected with a child, young person, what is it that you want for them? Doesn't matter what side of the aisle, doesn't matter where they live, they all say similar things. I want this young person to grow up and be happy and healthy. I want them to be able to take care of themselves and make good decisions. I want them to find a good partner who will love them and have a, a loving relation. Like, when you start to, and it doesn't matter where in the world, I've, I've been blessed to travel to Spain, to Portugal, I went to Australia. And when you talk to educators and people from around the world, when you pull back the educator speak, which, you know, for some using terms like SEL, you know, they don't know exactly what it means. And without being very clear, there's misunderstandings of what we're talking about. So the more we can get out there and share the story, show what it looks like, will help bring life. And one of the things I, I firmly believe is that we cannot bifurcate SEL and academics when we talk about recovery. We're not going to SEL our way out of this, and we're not going to academic, you know, just addressing academic our way out of this. We have to be thinking about the integration of both of those together in order to really be able to address the realities right now. And so, you know, for that person who would say, you know what, self-management has no room in a classroom. I'm like, oh yeah, tell that to a teacher who's trying to line up 20 kids to get down to the cafeteria, you know, and, or you say, oh, well, that's just a parent role. Well, think about on the, re you know, at the playground or on recess, or if you have a teenager who's driving a car, you want them to be able to say, you know what, I'm not going to respond to that text right now. I'm going to leave it and drive safely. So these skills are really transferable and show up in so many different ways and in, in adulthood and childhood and growing and learning that there, there's really just no way to separate the two. And of all the things to be politically charged about, social emotional learning and its role in academics should not be one. Amen. Uh, if, if only, I want to just say just parenthetically, Ali, I got a, an email the, about a few days ago from one of our colleagues, uh, Keith Matheny, who's trained some teachers in Texas and a bunch of parents who'd heard misinformation, I have to say, about social social emotional learning programs, pulled their kids out and challenged, you know, they didn't want their kids in the program. So he invited the parents to come watch. Mm -hmm. 
And the parent, one, a couple of the parents came and saw the lessons being taught and wrote a, a letter of, uh, of apology mm -hmm. saying, my God, I didn't know what this was. Uh, thank you for doing this for my son. I so uh, apologize for having caused this trouble. Anyway, the point so just being I not that we're perfect, but just that when people learn about what it really is, they tend to go, wow, that's great. I most parents are going like, I need this for myself. You know, it's not just for their kids. Well, I want to share two other things really quickly. Most recently, I um, had a chance to speak at a conference that was hosted by the U.S. Chamber of Com Commerce on workforce development and the future of work and pathways. And one employer said, because the question was asked, well, what would you do if social emotional learning wasn't in that school or in that community? He said, well, as a business person, I wouldn't take my business there. He said, because I need employees who can work cooperatively with others, who can solve complex problems, who can understand the perspective of others, who can make responsible decisions and show up on time, who can be empathetic for other people. And so here we have a business leader who is you know, so many businesses are trying to determine where to go, where to grow their, you know, their, um, where there's the best economic opportunity for their business. And if we don't want it in schools, we sure need to be thinking about how these young people are going to be prepared for the workforce, or if they go an alternative pathway and, you know, develop their own business. If you're a business leader, you still have to build your team. You still have to know how to work with people like Truly, we need to be thinking about the long-term impacts of these skills. And if we don't have them in schools where kids primarily practice the most, you know, with their other peers, yeah. we're in for, for some rough riding. Uh, we're almost out of time. We've got about four, maybe a little more than four minutes left. So I just want to do a quick around the horn here. Mark, I'll let you start out. Aaliyah has just given us a beautiful uh a summary of this, all learning is social and emotional. Uh, what's the next step, Mark? And you can answer this if you want to talk about something else. Uh, you, you, this is your chance to give your last comments. But uh, if you can, weave in your sense of where the research agenda is moving in the future. And then we'll go to Linda and then we'll close Aaliyah with you. Sure. I, I just first would like to say how um, how much gratitude I have for educators, teachers, and, and principals out there who have such a commitment and compassion for children in very difficult times and just to honor their their work. I think where the where the research is going is uh, is towards this idea of whole school models. And that is, is just as Linda was saying, uh, at, talking about how we integrate, we want to understand more about how we can systemically integrate all of these ideas to create the developmentally enriching environment that leads to both challenge and support for children to be their best, to find the passion that we hope that all children will find in their lives. And I'll mention that one of the, the parts that are missing here is the role of the principal. While we spent a lot of time with teachers, we spent very little time with administrators. And for example, to certify principals in the United States, they have no, no certification requirements that have to do with how to make a caring school, how to, how to, how to support social emotional learning in their buildings, et cetera. And so we need to look not just at the classroom level, but the school level and look at schools as wholes and how we can move the whole school development forward. That's that's the next step. Beautiful. Beautiful. Send us measures, Mark, and maybe maybe we can do this in follow up. People are interested in where the measures are now around that issue and where they're headed. Linda, you got a you got a minute. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to start just by plussing one on what Mark said and extend that a little bit. I think uh, you know both policy, uh, practice, and research need to be thinking about this systemic approach. We need to recognize that we inherited a factory model design for our schools. 100 years ago, it was rooted in this idea of an assembly line, you know, that everyone would be on. It had the idea that schools were for selecting and sorting and deliberately letting kids drop out who would not, you know, uh, be, you know, uh, going into knowledge work. Uh, it was designed in part by eugenicists who had ideas about the tracking systems and how those should map onto race and class. There's a lot in what our educators are trying to struggle with 
that is rooted in the design of schools. So we really need to be explicit about creating a new design, redesigning schools for the next hundred years in a way that is really uh, around this sort of whole child um, approach that is developmentally grounded in what we know about how human beings learn and develop and in which this social, emotional and academic uh, integration is uh, really planted. So um, I just ask that we put the design principles for schools in the chat and people will see that that's one way to think about it from a school level. Uh, and then we need to bring that also to the policy uh, framework. Thank you, Linda. Alia, 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. I, I honestly just, I want to hone in on the impact of technology in our changing world and how technology is changing the way we interact, changing the way we interact globally, even how we learn. And so as we think about SEL and AI and all these other trends that are happening, really still reminding us that there's people behind the technology. There's a person behind that classroom. There's a student on the receiving end and how important it is for us to have foundational, these social emotional learning skills that are foundational and transferable across life. We are all learning every day still. I know I learn something new every day and how when we talk about these skills, how critical they are to the discipline of learning and learning is a lifelong journey. So we really are, it's important to have these skills, so. Thank you, all three of you. Extraordinary. The, the, the Q&A is fantastic. I wish we had time for everything. I love to think that everybody on this call shares one belief, and that is that we love kids. We love children. We want to see them grow. We want to see them develop, not just ours, everybody's. Uh, and if we can bring translate that love into learning, loving to learn, learning to love, in some ways, strengthening relationships at the heart of that. We don't have to get too emotional about it, but we can we can wear our hearts a little bit on our sleeves. This is a scary time for a lot of people. And we're kind of more fragile in many ways than we've been. One teacher said to me the other day, I'm not concerned about learning loss. I'm concerned about relationship loss. If we focus on relationships, we will get to learning and we will do it well. And this field holds such enormous promise.